Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well this Thursday morning. Um, this is the Everett Ferguson Lecture in um, Early Christian Studies. A few years ago, uh, a group of scholars decided that it would be good um, to honor um, the life and legacy of one of the modern intellectual giants of the Stone Campbell tradition, Everett Ferguson, whose life and work um, in early Christian studies I, I need not even spell out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so widely and broadly known. Um, a committee was formed and we started talking to people and people gave and endowed a lecture. And I'll read the description that's provided um, in, in the booklet for the conference that I think aptly describes what this lecture is about. The endowed Ferguson lecture honors the legacy of a remarkable scholar and a man of deep Christian faith and features a renowned academician offering new research on the expansion and development of the early church. The lecture seeks to advance the spirit of Everett Ferguson's legacy in early Christian studies for current and future students by securing a place for serious dialogue and reflection. I should say Everett, the humble man that he is, um, originally would, did not want us to have the lecture in his honor. He's a, he's, he is a humble, humble man. However, um, his wife has amazing uh, persuasive powers to encourage him uh, <laughs> to do that. Um, and so this is the lecture that we now have. This is the fourth um, Ferguson Lecture in Early Christian Studies. Um, Elizabeth Clark gave the first lecture, Robert Wilkin the second, and um, Sidney Griffin the third. Um, and it is an honor and a privilege um, to have Margaret Mitchell as the fourth Everett Ferguson Lecturer in Early Christian Studies. Um, just a few words um, about Margie, as she's known to me. Um, Margaret Mitchell is the Shaler Matthews Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Literature at the University of Chicago Divinity School. She is a literary historian of ancient Christianity. Her research and teaching span a range of topics in New Testament and early Christian writings up through the end of the fourth century. And as Greg Sterling said yesterday, she actually does work through that entire period and, and in a way that commands the attention of all who specialize in any small portion of those centuries. Um, it's remarkable. She analyzes how the earliest Christians um, literally wrote their way into history developing a literary and religious culture that was deeply embedded in Hellenistic Judaism and the wider Greco-Roman world. Professor, Professor Mitchell is the author of four books, including Paul and the Rhetoric of Reconciliation, and is currently completing John Chrysostom on Paul, Praises and Problem Passages, to be published in the Writings from the Greco-Roman World series um, with the Society of Biblical Literature. Um, Margie is also my mentor and someone who has changed my life in many ways over the years. And also, and I say this um, without any equivocation, whatever, the smartest human being that I've ever met. Um, when she walks in a room, everybody pays attention. Um, it is an honor to have her here today. And without further ado, I hand it over to Margaret Mitchell. Well, Trevor, how can I ever live up to that? <laughs> um, thank you for your kind words. Um, I am truly honored to give the fourth Everett Ferguson lecture at the Christian Scholars Conference. Throughout my scholarly career, I have much admired the contributions of many scholarly colleagues in the Church of Christ, um, quite a few of whom I've seen uh, in yesterday and today, and some that whom we greatly miss, such as Professor Abraham Malherby, uh, whom I treasured as a scholarly mentor and friend. And we all miss Abe and Phyllis so much. And I have had the pleasure to teach and advise some of the next generation of Church of Christ scholars, such as Trevor Thompson and Matt Calhoun and Andrew Langford. Well, thank you, Trevor, for your kind introduction and for your part in both uh, the development of this lecture series and the invitation uh, to me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you at the 2017 CSC conference. This is the first one that I have attended. And I enjoyed yesterday's session on uh, Carl Holliday's book and look forward 
both to this lecture today and then another one later this afternoon, um, both of which come out of a current translation project of mine. But I want to say it was especially meaningful for me to be invited to give the Everett Ferguson Lecture. I've known Everett over the years, both uh, seeing and talking with him and Nancy at the North American Patristic Society meetings in Chicago year after year, and an especially memorable occasion at Abilene Christian when I gave the Carmichael Walling Lectures in 2006. Everett was a gracious member of the welcoming, uh, the home team uh, welcoming me on that visit, and it was the first time I had a chance to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one on, in a sustained uh, way with him. I remember wonderful conversations over meals, etc., with a man whose work I knew from afar. I remember over the years Everett's excellent and always respectful questions to lecturers at conferences. When I first saw him, was who is that? That's Everett Ferguson. His gracious demeanor, and especially his depth of knowledge of the ancient church. I have also drawn with profit, as we all have on his excellent published scholarship, including most recently for a project I was doing on the so-called Abertius inscription on his volume on baptism, and continually the Encyclopedia of Early Christianity, which he edited, and which sits right above my desk uh, in my home study, as well as, going back to quite a few years, the translation volume that he and Aid produced of Gregory of Nyssa's De Vita Moses uh, in the Classics of Christian Spirituality series. I've actually been uh, directing uh, two dissertations on the life of Moses at Chicago, um, and Abe and Everett's volume is still invaluable. I have only one regret, and that is that this esteemed gentleman scholar, Everett Ferguson, is not here with us today, but he's certainly with me in my thoughts, and I dedicate this talk to Everett with rich gratitude for all that he has done and continues to do for our field of study. So thank you for the invitation. Now there is a, a very long handout uh, which accompanies this lecture and you would, I think, want each of you to have a copy of that handout. Let me introduce what I want to do with you this morning. The abstract provides the overall goal and thesis of my talk today, which comes out of my current research, which includes a translation of 18 homilies by John Chrysostom, the great orator bishop from Antioch and Constantinople who lived from 347 to 407. And these are on what I call Pauline problem texts. And they are a laboratory for seeing how the Bible is both problem and solution and in turn problem in the early church. My talk later this afternoon is on a quite different set of problems having to do with Romans 16.3. Um, the talk Today, uh, this morning, I'm going to do with you having in front of you both the Greek text and my translation because the argument, as you will see, is rooted in close exegetical details. And I want you, as fellow scholars of ancient Christian literature, to see exactly what it is that I'm translating and also be able to interact with my translation as, as you can, but most of all with John's argument. This afternoon, I'm going to do it completely orally without any visual aids because, of course, Chrysostom did not hand out handouts in the church, the great church at Antioch or in Constantinople. This was live oratory explicating uh, the Christian scriptures uh, in the polis. And so uh, the medium really does matter. But in this case, this is a, a, a homily that I really want you to see the textured language that he's using and really how complicated the arguments are. So um, in, in brief, this lecture analyzes the occasional homily that John Chrysostom preached, likely in Constantinople, that is circa 398 to, four, uh, to 403, in elud propter fornicatione sucorum, or homily in, on 1 Corinthians 7.2, in which Chrysostom seeks to recast the traditional ritual forms of speech and song at a wedding celebration, such as the uh, gamelios, which is the wedding speech, the humanios, the hymns and acclamations to the god Hymen in the procession of the bride to the groom's house, and the epithalamios, or katunastikos, or the song at the marital bed, which Man Menander Rhetor, Rhetor uh, in the third century euphoniously called a protrope prostein sumplochein, 
or an exhortation to consummation. And this is literally a, 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 an oration that would be sung or, or a song or a speech that would be sung as people were surrounding where the marital couple had gone to begin their marriage. Um, and what Chrysostom is seeking to do, and this is what we're going to study this morning, is how does he transform these into Christianized and scripturally inflected terms? How can such a cultural shift of one of the most enduring features of ancient Mediterranean life take place? There were not yet distinctive Christian marriage rituals. And so this is what we did, is we gave songs to Aphrodite and acclamations to Hymen and sang various songs and so on. So how is Chrysostom going to Christianize these? How is he going to incorporate them into the development of a post-Constantinian imperial Christian culture? I argue that in the course of his homily, which is both deadly serious and perhaps I suggest has maybe a little more than a free saw of humor to it, that John mimics the traditional cultural forms in some interesting and surely deliberate ways, including by offering a competing etiology or narrative of the origins for the institution of marriage itself, such as is often found in traditional wedding speeches, and a new form of hymnody to accompany the bride to her wedding chamber in her new husband's home. Most strikingly in this homily, John plays continually on the language and tropes of Greek love magic. Uh, my colleague at Chicago, Christopher Ferroni, in the classics department, distinguishes between eros magic and philia ma magic. Eros magic is from the more dominant party, usually the male, seeking to make someone be in love with them and literally to possess them in the sense that they're so in love with them that, uh, that they are drawn to the one who's practicing the Eros magic. Philia magic is the magic usually of the subordinate partner and often of the, of the wife who is seeking through that magical art to keep her husband in fidelity to herself. Um, John knows of these distinctions, I think, and is playing off of them in the homily. And he uses this language and tropes of Greek love magic to warn married men against porneia. And porneia um, is a Greek word which um, can mean either sexual malfeasance of a generalized nature or very specifically sex with prostitutes. And that will be an important thing as we go through the homily to know that John uh, sees the term uh, in both of its senses. And Chrysostom wants to argue, contrary to contemporary law and custom, that porneia, and in this sense of sex with prostitutes, is equivalent to moicheia, which is adultery. And this is an argument that we'll see emerge. John doesn't just oppose love magic, therefore, but I argue he also offers his own authorized version of a Christian love magic to avert the powerful erotic charms of the porne, that is, to defeat the demons of porneia. Now, if you feel squeamish about talking about porneia in church, <laughs> as we're here in this glorious chapel, that's in fact a key part of the oration that Chrysostom delivers, is that the Christian scripture that was just read and on which he has to comment was Paul talking about marriage and saying that marriage should be uh, carried out because of porneia. In other words, uh, to avert porneia. So it's in his sacred text and he's having to deal with the kind of, should we be talking about that in here sense? So if you feel a little uncomfortable, um, you're right where you should be in a certain sense because that's in a way the homiletical setup. And then lastly, a point on method. The full force of this argument that Chrysostom makes in this homily, I argue, can only be seen when one translates properly the technical magical vocabulary and when one follows the full rhetorical span of the whole homily. 
carefully conceived as it is from its proemion, its introduction, down to its epilogos, to its conclusion. And that's why you have a handout that spans 15 pages, because I don't just want to dip in and out. Um, uh, I want you to see how this theme of, of love magic uh, unites the whole. And then for text critics among you out there, um, uh, the text that I've been translating is the Minya text, which goes back to an earlier European Morel edition. But we have, uh, from 1998, a, an Italian critical edition of this homily. And in some cases, it has recovered readings. And in one case, a whole passage that was not in the manuscripts that were used in the original publication of these homilies, which was actually by Frederick Field, um, to whom I give uh, the cover art. Um, Frederick Field published the first edition of the Greek text of the homilies of Chrysostom, including these miscellaneous homilies in 1611. And uh, 10 days from now, I'll be in the Bodleian uh, in Oxford looking at his printer's, um, uh, his printer's pages for that magnificent uh, edition. Um, so anyway, that's all by way of preamble. Uh, if you're ready to go, let's jump in. Proemion, come to where the sweetest honey is to be found. Today I wish to lead you to fountains of honey, a honey of which one can never get too much. For such is the nature of Paul's words, and all those who fill up their own hearts from these fountains speak forth in the Holy Spirit. Or rather, the pleasure of the divine utterances overshadows even the excellence of honey. The prophet shows this when he says, how sweet in my throat are your utterances, more than honey, and more, more than honey and honeycomb in my mouth. Chrysostom begins by extolling the sweet honey of the Pauline letters. The reference to a honey of which one cannot get enough is probably an explicit reference to a famous tag from one of the odes of Pindar, which, uh, which essentially says the opposite, says even honey can become overfilling or cloying as can the delightful blossoms of Aphrodite's sexual pleasures. So John is beginning the homily with a traditional, somewhat, um, uh, a traditional tag out of Greek love lore, and he's turning it around and saying the honey that most satisfies the honey that one can never get enough of is the letters of Paul. And if you have read much of Chrysostom, you know that Chrysostom says he understands Paul better than anyone else because he loves Paul more than anyone else. And uh, Paul is on every page in every paragraph of Chrysostom. And so he begins on this beautiful exhortation with basically a bid to the audience, come and taste the honey that is the sweetest honey of all. Now if you turn to the next page, and these are, uh, each passage is named by alphabet, you can see. So to, into text B, where is the sweetest uh, honey to be found? For indeed, honey is destroyed in the digestive process, but the divine utterances at the time when they are digested become sweeter and more useful, both to those who possess them and to many others. Now someone who en plentifully enjoys a physical meal and then belches from it is most unpleasant to his companion. But one who has belched out utterances from the spiritual teaching shares the rich fragment fragrance with his neighbor. Come on, you're supposed to laugh, come on. Indeed, David, when he continually enjoyed this kind of feasting said, my heart belched out in a good word, eruxato hekardiamu logon agathon, eruxo ex eruxesai, translating the Hebrew, rahash, um, belching forth. Um, yet it's possible to belch forth a wicked word, too. In the case of a physical meal, the quality of the belching is produced in accordance with the nature of the foods eaten. In the same way, with the power of words, many people belch forth the kind of things they eat. For example, if you go up to the theater and you listen to whorish hymns, um, uh, asmata pornica, then those are the kind of words you will surely belch out to your neighbor. 
But if by coming to church you share in the hearing of spiritual things, then those are the kind of belches you'll have as well. That's why the prophet said, my heart belched out a good word showing us the nature of the meal he shared. So Chrysostom begins um, on the, this comparison, right? So Paul's letters provide the sweetest honey. And if you uh, eat of the sweetest honey, then you will have this sort of aura of um, sweetness around you. And the contrast is this ugly image of the sort of rude, bombastic belcher who even worse is belching forth the kinds of words that they imbibe in those other places. And he means here the theater and the racetrack and the street and other places where these uh, whorish hymns, as he calls them, uh, asmata, um, pornica, um, are, are imbibed. So you see he's playing on a lot of different tropes here about what is good and what is bad. Um, the issue he begins with is, um, would you be sure Carl gets the hand out in the back? Um, that the, the issue that he begins with is an issue uh, that he crafts a bit um, uh, geographically. That is, that there are assemblies out there, and then there's our assembly in here. We have these sweet spiritual belchings, but out there they have these terrible belchings because of that which they digest. And of course this is metaphorical for uh, speech as well. So in text C, in assemblies out there in the world, even if occasionally something useful might be said, on many sordid occasions, loads of people hardly utter a single thing that's salutary. But in the case of the divine scriptures, it's the exact opposite. You'll never hear a single wicked word in them. But all the words are full of salvation and profound philosophy. Such indeed are the things read to us today. What are these? Now concerning what you wrote to me, Paul says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But on account of sexual misconduct, Pornea, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Now, what we can see is that the proemian or the beginning of this, uh, of this oration has set up a set of antitheses for the arguments to come. What never gives out, what gives out? Digest away, becomes sweeter and stronger when digested. Spiritual belching, belching wicked words. Church, Theater, words that build up, words that corrupt and debauch. Pure mind, dirty mouth, words of scripture, whorish hymns, pornica, asmata. So here you can see the problem is that John has set up that out there are these awful discourses, but in here everything is full of profound philosophy, and yet the scriptural text is about Pornea. So immediately there's a kind of uh, perhaps discord for John, right? That he wants to claim that the scriptures contain full philosophy, but he's going to have to deal with why is it that the Apostle Paul defends marriage on the basis of this distasteful subject that certainly, Carl, when you walked in and heard me talking about belching and pornea in a chapel, you would think, what is going on here, right? And this is, uh, of course, the setup uh, for Chrysostom. Um, Paul's answer was that marriage was diatas porneas, that marriage was because of either acts of or the cases of sexual misconduct, sexual malfeasance, or sex with prostitutes. So how is John going to address this? Um, those of you who uh, work in Hellenistic philosophy know that it is in fact a philosophical question Gameteon eu, right? Should we marry or not? As we find in Musonius Rufus and other places. It is about marriage, can be a philosophical topic, and Chrysostom is going to try to do that to some degree uh, in the homily um, that follows. 
But it's not, strictly speaking, a homily that's rooted in philosophical discourse, as I've argued uh, earlier, uh, um, as it is in the tropes of Greek love magic, as we shall see when we turn to text D. Text D is the proposition of the homily, where uh, what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4 is characterized by John. Um, this is on page three. I hope you're able to navigate the handout uh, text D. Paul lays down laws, nomothete, about marriage, and he's not ashamed, nor does he blush. So Paul is not ashamed or blushing at talking about this unsavory topic, and rightly so. For his master, Christ, esteemed marriage and wasn't ashamed of it, but he even honored the practice with both his presence and a gift. For indeed, Christ brought the greatest gifts of all to the wedding by changing the nature of water into wine. Obviously, uh, the wedding at Cana story in John 2. Then rightly, his servant Paul doesn't blush when laying down laws about these things. For marriage is not a wicked practice. What is wicked is adultery. What is wicked is sexual misconduct. And marriage is a potion that destroys sexual misconduct. Gamos de porneas anaireticon pharmacon. Here, crucially, you can see that John's proposition is that marriage is a magical potion against the demon of pornea. Um, the actual language here of anaireticon pharmacon can be translated either as a poisonous potion or as a potion that destroys, and that's how I've taken it in my translation, one that destroys its object, which is pornea. So John has used language about, mar uh, about magic to describe what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians 7, which is not, in fact, the language that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul doesn't go into uh, love magic um, in that text. So this is the proposition of the homily before us, is that Paul, as a lawgiver, with his law, laid down a prescription for how to deal with the demon of pornea, and it is marriage. Um, now, the other thing that you should know as we make a transition into the next argument is that in Greek, the word gamos means marriage, but also, especially in the plural gamoi, it means wedding celebration. And I think it does in modern English that, um, I guess, um, well, marriage, wedding, at any rate, it can refer both to the institution and to the way it's celebrated. And that'll be important for what comes next um, in his argument. Um, so maybe I'm going to pause here before we move into the next argument, which is a comparison that John wants to set up between uh, conventional marital pract uh, practices, and he means by that uh, wedding ceremonies, and what he thinks ought to be the case uh, for Christian marriage. So now I've set up the argument with John in the proemion and in the proposition. Are there any questions for clarification or just comments? Carl? Would be a poisonous potion against or for pornea. Um, and I think that the adjective on Ireticos, or one of its cognates in LSJ, um, uses that it's used for poison. So, and, but the idea is that it's an obliterative potion against pornea. Any other questions or comments so far? It's a... Yes, I think that's absolutely right, and, and thank you for, for bringing that up, because um, one of the elements of magic, as we'll see in a moment, is uh, prophylaxis, right? That is, that magic isn't only what you do when you've been beset by a demon or by illness. Magic is also a part of setting up um, a zone of safety around oneself, and that's what vaccinations do, for example, or um, or, or you know, antibiotics once one's sick. So that's a, that's a key part uh, of this. And as you know, and I'm sure have heard repeatedly, in ancient um, uh, discourses, um, medicine and magic and religion are not easily distinguishable always. 
And this homily by Chrysostom is a nice example of that. That Chrysostom on other occasions is completely against amulets, never use these things, etc. But what you see here is that he's actually drawing on the language of magic to get his congregants to see the value of false teaching and how it may uh, affect their own relations. Yes? Um, we will know, um, and you are going to see some, I think in a way, shockingly concrete statements, which themselves may or may not be metaphorical. So I'm going to come back to you and you see some of the passages where John talks about how the text of 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4 gets activated as this pharmacon, as this potion. So it's a great question. Um, and as often with John, um, metaphors, you know, he lives in metaphor, um, but they're, shock they're, they're always real in the sense that he, he, he certainly thinks that the power of words to shape human experience is, is, is paramount. So it's a great question, and you'll see some passages in, in, in a minute. All right, well then let's move into the first movement uh, in the argument. Uh, so the first argument is, as I mentioned earlier, this synchrisis is, a, uh, is the Greek term for rhetorical comparison. Um, and John is going to set up a rhetorical comparison between what you do at weddings and what he would like them to do at weddings. Um, so let passage be. So then, let's not dishonor gamos, marriage, uh, gamoi, with satanic processions, diabolikai, pompai, but let those now marrying wives do just as they did in Cana of Galilee. Let them have Christ in their midst. And how is this possible, someone says? Through the presence of the priests themselves. For the one who receives you, Christ says, receives me, Matthew 10, uh, 10 40. But if you would drive away s Satan, if you would drive out the whorish hymns, the effeminate songs, the disorderly choruses, the shameful words, the satanic procession, the commotion, the pealing laughter, and the rest of the unseemliness, then you would, and you would bring in the holy servants of Christ, then Christ will be fully present in them, along with his mother and his brothers. For he says, whoever does the will of my father is the person who is my brother and sister and mother. Now I know that I seem to some to be heavy-handed and irksome, when I advise these things and buck an ancient custom. But that doesn't bother me at all, for I don't want your gratitude, but your betterment, not your applause and praise, but your gain and philosophical life. Don't let anyone say to me, it's a custom, the ethos esti, for where sin is brazenly enacted, don't you mention custom. If the practices are wicked, even if the custom is an ancient one, eradicate them. But if the practices aren't wicked, even if they're not customary, bring them in and cultivate them. So you can see at the, in, in the, right after the Matthew quote, that in a sense what we have here is Chrysostom's characterization of all of those customary features of an ancient wedding ceremony as I outlined them very briefly in the Precy, right? So you can see what he calls the whorish hymns are these hymns um, while the bride is being processed to the groom's home, um, effeminate songs, disorderly choruses, shameful words. We'll talk more about those. Uh, there's a very specific reference perhaps in a minute. Um, the satanic procession, he's talking about this Pompeii of the bride to her uh, husband's home, commotion, laughing, uh, laughing and the rest, which is all for him, aschemogene. It's all unseemliness. Um, so this is how he characterizes what for, what for his congregants and for the society at large is this is how you do a wedding. Like these are the things that we do. And the, the songs that he's talking about are probably hymns to Aphrodite, um, as I mentioned, hymns Homenia to the god Hymen. These were traditional hymns that people had sung for years and years and years. And, but for John, these are satanic. Now you can see um, that he also recognizes that this is a palaion ethos, that this is an ancient custom. 
And a part of ancient uh, marriage customs was to retell the story of why we do it this way. Um, and I think we, we have, you can see John is saying we do it this way because of, of, John, uh, of, of the gospel according to John chapter two, right? I mean, he's trying to argue we too have a history with marriage, more of that to come um, in a minute. But how do you unseat a polyon ethos? How do you change an ancient custom that's always the way we've done things? Now you can see that John is saying, um, is, is saying, I know you think I'm a, I, I'm a, um, um, a killjoy, right? I know you find me irksome about this. But he says, I am seeking your greater good. I'm seeking your philosophical betterment. And what he means by that is your comportment of your life with your values, and in particular um, with uh, sexual chastity or, or, or sexual modesty, uh, sophosuna. So uh, let's turn now to text F. More of the description of the ancient marital practices with Chrysostom's critique sewn into them. Now to show you that such unseemly acts, askemonen, uh, were not an ancient custom, in fact, but these are actually a relative, a recent invention, kind of to me. Call to mind how Isaac married Rebecca, how Jacob married Rachel. For scripture makes mention of their weddings in Genesis 24, 29. And it tells how these brides were led into the houses of the bridegrooms, and it doesn't mention any custom like this. Instead, they made a feast and a banquet more joyous than is now customary, and they invited suitable guests to the wedding celebration, while flutes, panpipes, cymbals, leaping about like asses, and all the rest of the present unseemly behavior were nowhere in sight. But the choral singers in our day sing hymns to Aphrodite, and on that very day, they sing about serial adultery. They're telling the hymns of the gods, right, and the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the various acts of the gods defilement of marriages, illicit loves, and unlawful couplings, and many other songs filled with impiety and shame. And after a drunken bout with such great unseemliness, they parade the bride publicly around with shameful words. So tell me, how do you demand her to be chaste when you train her in such shamelessness from the first day and have things said and done before her eyes that aren't right even for dutiful slaves to hear? The father, together with the mother, has for such a long time taken care, great pains to guard their virgin daughter so she might not say nor hear another person speaking any words like these, busily devising private bedrooms, living quarters for women, guard, guards, doors, bolts, and nighttime sorties, letting her be seen by no one, not even your close friends, and many more practices beyond these. And now, in a single day, you've gone and squandered all those efforts by making her become shameless through that dishonorable procession, introducing corrupt words into the bride's soul. Now, here again, you can see that John is describing the, the conventional practices, and he wants to argue that there's such a thing as Christian marriage that's even older than these appeals to Aphrodite and others. Um, as you may have noticed, he, he, he skips entirely over the bed trick, which has Leah wind up in bed, right, rather than Rachel um, in, in, in Genesis, right? He makes it sound as though the patriarchal wedding celebrations were all completely regular, um, passing by um, some of the difficulties. And instead, um, you know, he just sets that up there as this is our ancient custom. Um, but at the same time, he's seeking a then and now contrast for their own behavior. And there's, a, there's social reality here. You can see how he describes how the mother and father of a, of a young girl would keep her in the back of the house. The nighttime sorties are for her because she can't go out into the agora in, uh, in the middle of the day because she largely isn't seen, especially elite households. She's not seen by other men. And so John's trying to say, on the one hand, you treat your virginal daughters this way, and then 
they come out in their debut on their wedding day to this shameful culture that's the exact opposite of everything that you've tried to do in, uh, in, in, uh, in protecting her. And you know, I, I, he's, uh, he's trying to get right at the, their, um, their own, um, what he considers their own um, inconsistency. Um, we know that this was an issue in ancient marital culture um, because Menandor Rador, again, who is uh, um, writing a book about um, speeches of celebration, says there is a little bit of a problem, which is that um, the, the person who is supposed to get up and give the speech about the beauty of the bride needs to be really careful not to describe it too accurately because that would show that he's been in the back of the house. Right? So he's supposed to act like, now that I see her for the first time, she's very beautiful. Right? Um, at the same time, Menendez Retor says, when you uh, give speeches, the gamelios, at the wedding, never use the word sofrosune, which is the word for uh, sexual chastity um, and moderation because he says what you're supposed to celebrate is the exuberance of sexuality because you're trying to really bring down uh, the forces of fertility on the couple. So the last thing that you would mention um, in, the, in the oratory would be the lack of sexual congress because the point of the wedding celebration is to bless the couple that they be fruitful and multiply. So this is a complicated uh, social dance um, that's going on here. Now let's turn uh, to text G. In light of what I just said about how the oratory and the events are meant to shower blessings down on the couple, look at what John concludes. Doesn't this kind of wedding celebration result in the bad things that follow? Doesn't it result in adultery and jealous rivalries? Doesn't it result in childishness, widowhood, children being left orphans before their time? For when you summon demons with these songs, tus daimonas kales, when you fulfill their desire with these shameful words, when you bring actors and fairies and the entire theater into your home, when you fill the house with prostitutes and you have the whole chorus of demons revel there, tell me, what healthy outcome do you expect later? And why is it that you bring priests in when you're going to carry out these sorts of rites on the next day. Now this summoning of demons, this is how John understands traditional marriage cultus, is it's basically calling demons into the marriage, which will bring about sterility, d divorce, illness, uh, sick children, right, all of these things. This is how John understands it. Um, now the reason he thinks that is because he assumes that actors are sexually um, uh, licentious. So actresses are pornai, are prostitutes in his view, and the other actors are often effeminate men, um, and somewhat controversially perhaps, I translated Malakoi here as fairies. Um, uh, there's always an issue if you're translating an ancient text, uh, do you sanitize it along the way, or do you try to find a modern equivalent, and I, I, I go back and forth on this, but I'm using fairies at the moment because it's meant to be a slap. It means softies, is what the, the, the Greek word means. And so John assumes that the male actors who are often dressed up in female parts, and there's a lot of, of transvestitism as a part of the, 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 the bawdiness of the wedding ceremony, that these are all um, bringing the demons of Pornea into the marriage. So this is what he's trying to argue. So at the very moment when you should be exorcising demons, you are in fact inviting them to join the marriage. And therefore, he argues, uh, theodicy is that this is why the marriage fails. But, um, so what's the counter proposal? The ca and, and notice I, I emphasized uh, the, the phrase, tus daimonos kales. So kalein means to summon, as in demon, it's a language in the magical uh, handbooks, etc. It also means to invite. And now see what John, where he goes next with his counter proposal. A new custom for marriage celebrate, Christian marriage celebrations and public manufaction. Invite Christ to your wedding, not Satan. So how do you invite Christ 
to your wedding. See where he goes. So, oh, and, and I should say, this issue of ostentatious display, um, just as today, is a very high social marker to be able to put on a lavish wedding ceremony, right? It's a public act showing the father's wealth um, and his prominence as to who and how many people get invited. And often it involves a kind of public benefaction, just like today, because you're feeding all these people, right? They're coming and you're paying money and they are receiving the benefaction of food, drink, dancing, music, all these things. Do you wish to show that there's profit in ostentatious displays? Invite choruses of poor people, and he's referring now to the Gospel Logia um, from Matthew and Luke. Ah, but no doubt you're ashamed and embarrassed at that. What could be worse than this craziness? That when you drag Satan into your house, you don't think you're doing anything shameful, but at the prospect of bringing Christ in, you blush with shame? For just as Christ is present when the poor enter in, thus the devil revels in their midst when fairies and actors set up chorus there, set up a chorus there. From the latter expenditure comes no profit at all, but indeed the potential for greater harm. Whereas from the former expenses, you'll quickly receive a huge reward. So John turns the invitation uh, back around to say, invite the poor in, right? And he's using uh, the, the, both the logia and parables in the gospel tradition. R invite the poor to your wedding celebration. Um, what he's playing on here also is this idea, it's a magic idea, um, that, the, that there's a, the objection is that to bring poor people to the wedding would be a bad omen because it would be an omen that the couple may suffer poverty. And John's trying to argue the reverse. He's trying to say that for a Christian wedding ceremony, to invite the poor in is to invite Christ. And therefore, the opposite of summoning demons is summoning Christ. Christ in the person of the poor. And I think especially the great parable of Matthew 25, which inhabits so much of Christendom's uh, Christian uh, spirituality uh, is, in, is in view here. But the issue is, how do you get a new custom started? Right? If the whole point of the marriage ceremony is, we celebrate, we've always done it this way, and this is how we continue to do it. Uh, turn with me to text H, or I, excuse me, on the top of page six. But no one in our city has done this before? Well then, why don't you hurry to start it? and be the inaugurator of this virtuous custom so that those who come afterwards will trace it back to you. And if someone admires and imitates this custom, then his grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be able to tell those who inquire that it was so-and-so who was the first to introduce this good custom. So I'm not gonna read the rest of that paragraph, but you see how John is saying, you know, how do you get a custom? Well, somebody's gotta start it, so why don't you be the one? who starts it, and then it can be passed on from generation to generation, right? And you will have been the inaugurator of it. So, and you can see at the very end of that passage that he's trying to contrast spiritual with social rewards, right? That you may think it's a social reward that everybody in town thinks you're really a hot shot because you could rent out the grand ballroom at the Hilton for your wedding ceremony, but John, of course, has in mind the rewards in heaven. And the rewards in heaven, according to Matthew 25, and the great parable are that in as much as you did this to the least of these, you did it to me. So come, uh, you who are the sheep and not the goats, right? So John is setting up that concept. Um, maybe stop and, and ask any questions about, about wedding ceremonies thus far or some of this argument that John is making. see that a fair amount in that passage where John is saying you do so much to protect the sophrosune or the chastity of your virginal daughter and then she comes out into the world into this um, miasm of ribald songs and um, jokes and, and, and tauntings um, and, and so on and, 
and but I think you know the procession, of course, is in some sense a procession of property. Um, this is a patriarchal culture that's assumed. She goes from the home of her father, who uh, who has own, has sovereignty over her, to the home of the of the husband who has that sovereignty. And that's one of the other reasons it's a public act is it's out there in the street for everyone to see that this woman is now under the sovereignty of her, of her, new, uh, of her new male, um, which is her husband. Car? Yes, please. To, to, to some degree, um, the whole weight of the culture is. I mean, John is climbing uphill here. Um, and it's clear, because he's, he's preaching this homily to a Christian congregation at worship, that he assumes that they need to hear this because they are not, you know, they're not doing what he says. But part of it is that there wasn't such a cultural form yet. We, we, we could see at the very end of, of uh, was it passage H, um, no, excuse me, I'm in, of passage G, that they're adding the priest, they put the priest in the day before. So they, they kind of add in, like, you know, bring the priest over, and he probably blesses the couple. We, we don't fully have a marital right uh, at that point, um, a Christian marital right. So he's the one who's, who's climbing uphill. Um, and where we especially have these descriptions, and that's why I draw on Menandor Retor, because he's teaching people how to give these speeches. And in turn, he gives examples of these speeches. So that's a really precious source for me of, of, of that. Um, and um, so that's especially, I mean, I know I'm in kind of bedrock cultural assumptions because those rhetorical handbooks are not the place where originality arises. These are, um, they're copied one from the other down through time and they, they're basically socializing people into these cultural forms. But thanks, that's a, good, a very good question. Um, all right, let's move on then to, um, let's see, where were we? Oh yes, I wanted to get into J. Um, practice apotropaic almsgiving, not apotropaic obscenity. Um, the prayer of widows and poor people is so much more useful than any burlesque or choral dance. From the latter comes delight for a single day, but from the former perpetual gain. Consider how magnificent it is for the bride, having received such great blessings on her head, to enter into the house of the groom. What crowns are more noble than these things? What amount of wealth more useful? And yet the practices which now take place are the height of delirium and derangement. For even if no punishment or chastisement were lying in store for those who perform such unseemly acts, Still, consider how great a chastisement is endured by those who are dressed down with such insults in public by people who are drunk and mentally defiled, an allusion to 1 Timothy 6.5, with everyone listening. When the poor receive things, they offer a blessing, and they join in prayer for countless good things. But those revilers, those over-imbibing and overeating, pour all kinds of filthy jokes down on the head of those who are marrying, as though they had a kind of satanic rivalry with one another. And just as though enemies were locked in battle, so did their relatives engage in competition with one another in pronouncing speakable and unspeakable reproaches about the married, married couple to vanquish their opponents. And their contention with one another causes the groom along with the bride to be ashamed to the highest degree. Now, on the one hand, you could think, well, I've been at wedding receptions where um, uh, jokes uh, are told and where in the toasts, everyone wonders how many old boyfriends and girlfriends will be mentioned and, you know, the kind of sport of getting the couple uh, to, um, to, be, um, to be embarrassed. Um, there's probably some of that here, but there's also something even more, and it's important, again, on my theme of magic. 
Um, this is uh, the use of insults is um, considered to be apotropaic. That is, that one of the ways to deal with the demons that may beset the couple is you kind of get there first um, and you pronounce obscene speech as a form of prophylaxis to keep the demons away. Um, the most famous of these are called the Fescanini versus, which are um, well known, in, especially in the western part of the empire. They are deliberately obscene songs and speeches which are used in order to thwart demons. So this is what John is talking about here. Is Some of it is sport, but some of it is also magic intended to protect the couple. And John's answer and response is that when you give the poor food, they too use speech acts that impact the couple, but it's blessings rather than these apotropaic curses. It's a pretty brilliant argument, I think, on, on, on his part. Um, so he's trying to say, if you invite the poor to the wedding, um, then they will bless you and the marriage will be successful. That's his argument. All right, let's move ahead um, into the, 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 the darker side of the magic. Um, I'm on page seven. As I said, John assumes that when you hire a band and you hire a musician, or, you know, vocalists, to the wedding reception, that you're actually inviting porn eye into your house because he assumes that the musicians are uh, sexually promiscuous uh, and so on. So now watch how it gets quite real. So who in the end will dispute the fact, text K, that all these things are both said and done by them because demons are moving their souls? No one will dispute it. For these sorts of things, retaliations, insults, drunken bouts, psychic derangement, belong to the devil. Now, if someone might regard it as an ill omen for the poor to be invited in, I mentioned that earlier, instead of the usual retinue, and say these are signs of misfortune, let them learn this as well. What is a sign of utter odiousness and countless calamities is not the poor and widows being fed, but the fairies and prostitutes. For often the prostitute having from that very day forward taken the groom captive from his friends, Aikmaloton Labusa, has gone off and extinguished the eros that he had for his bride, dragged away his unoya, his goodwill, and destroyed his agape before it has been inflamed and sown in him the seeds of adultery. Fathers should be afraid of these things. Here's the patriarchal. Um, he's in charge of the wedding. And even if for no other reason, they should prevent actors and dancers from coming to wedding celebrations. Now, you can see here, first of all, this contrast between who gets invited to the wedding and whether they are blessing or cursing the couple that we've seen in various places. But now it gets very practical. Now we see John assumes that the porne is, a, is one who practices black magic. She practices that eros magic in order to steal the husband on the very wedding day away from his wife. And the language John uses of taking captive is the language of ancient love magic. But the point of ancient love magic is make someone be my possession. May they be possessed by their love for me. And so John is saying, this is the trap that the porne will set for the husband on the very wedding day, right there in the wedding reception. And he's saying, why would you then invite her to the wedding ceremony? And there's also a misogyny element to the way he characterizes her, of course, um, that, that comes in play with this. Um, now, I, you, I wanted you also, though, to see that um, th this alignment, that he has arrows that's supposed to be directed toward his wife, but it may be misdirected to the porne. And he should also have agape for his wife, but it too may be destroyed um, when his affections are, are, are taken away. So this is a real problem, right? And this is how, how, John, um, how John characterizes it. Now, argument number two, so why was marriage introduced at all? I'm gonna abbreviate a bit here, um, but uh, John begins, uh, well, as the conventional um, gamelios or the wedding speech um, provides an etiology of why we have weddings. Um, we saw a little hint of that with John 2, a little hint of it with the patriarchs from Genesis, 
But now John picks up the form. So he was taught this in school too, right? So this is the thing that's interesting is he is now enacting the form, but in a contrary way. And he says, marriage has been introduced not so that we might engage in debauchery nor sexual misconduct, but so that we might be chaste. And it is the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 that provide for him the backing and uh, the legislation even for that to be the case. And now look what he says. I would, and the, these are the words, but on account of sexual misconduct, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. I would wish for each of you to inscribe this passage on your mind and for yourselves each to lead his own bride into the house of the bridegroom using these words and to have this very statement carved on the walls of the house and on the bridal chamber and on the marital bed itself. But on account of sexual misconduct, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Here you can see that John is having 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4, um, 7, 2 in particular, serve as this is the pharmacon. This is, uh, this is itself a kind of mental amulet that you have it in your head. It becomes the competing wedding song, the song by which the bride is to be brought to the bridegroom's home. It becomes what is known in ancient magic as a house phylactery or an actual inscription. Now, how real and how metaphorical is this? Um, as your good question put it, is an interesting question. Does John really think that they will chisel this on the walls outside the home? Um, probably not, but that's what he's saying, is that these words are a bulwark against the demons of Pornea. And then he moves inside the social space of the house from the walls to outside, to the marital chamber, to the bed itself. And all of these are meant to be uh, a protective force. So this is the competing Christian love magic that I talked about, right? Um, and John is, is constructing it as a house amulet, a house uh, phylactery, but also as a kind of amuletic force uh, for, um, for uh, the, the, the wearer. Um, you can hear echoes, I imagine, of the Shema here. And so this is Chrysostom's Shema of sex, if you will, is 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Is you're supposed to be repeating this constantly um, and you're supposed to have it inscribed all around your home in order to protect your marriage and to protect its sanctity. Um, and the reason that passage is in blue is that this is one of the passages from the, um, uh, the, the Italian critical edition and noted in, first, in, in the first paragraph, that, uh, in the first footnote, that, that, that's been recovered by a, a closer reading of the manuscripts. And it's a magnificent passage, I think. It tells us a lot. Um, now, in case you're interested, I have not yet found uh, any instance of 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4 on an actual Christian amulet. Um, looking at the catalogs by De Bruyne and a recent book by Bryce Jones, I don't think it is, uh, it, it has yet been found on an actual amulet. But that's what John is describing. Um, so let me ask you, do you think this is, is this real or solely metaphorical? Yeah. It's, it's, it's powerful, right? I mean, it's, it's not just an evocation of, 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 a, of a metaphor. Um, but I'm not sure he means that they should put it on the house. Yes. Yeah. Oh, not so much, although, um, let, me, let me just skip ahead to this, because I'm probably not going to, I, I want to open up more for questions, and we have a lot of different things in here, but I will, if I can point you to, um, um, where is this, just give me a second. Yeah, on, um, on page 15, 
um, on text X, which is the almost the last one, um, he goes to Proverbs rather than to the song in order to create a kind of um, uh, Christian call to eroticism within the context of marriage. And so, let an affectionate doe and a filly of your fancies consort with you. Let the fountain of your water be your own fountain. This is basically uh, drink water from your own water fountain. That is, uh, um, uh, and this is very male-centered, but you, O oh men, satisfy your sexual urges with your own wife in your own home. And so, he could as well, perhaps, have gone to the song, which is, a, um, uh, but in this case, he went to Proverbs. And, and it's a quite, it's an interesting play, I think, that John makes. All right, let me, let's, let's uh, run through a little bit more um, that, that, that argument. Um, let's see. On the, on the pharmacon. So come with me to page eight, uh, text M. Oh, yeah, sorry, we're still in the why did marriage come about. I'm going to summarize this. Um, John begins by saying there are two reasons marriage was introduced. One is so that we might be chaste, sophronomen, and the second is that we might become fathers, hinapateres, Um In the course of that long passage M that I'm not going to read, John says the two reasons were there from the beginning because the human race needed to be populated. But actually now that the church is here, um, we don't even need uh, to become fathers um, because now we have spiritual fathership and ch childhood. Um, even We even have spiritual um, uh, elder care, he argues. Um, so therefore, there's not a need. That's not a need. So there's really only one reason for marriage. If you look at the very last four lines of the passage, there's only one mo motivation for marriage to not commit acts of sexual misconduct and then see the re repetition. And that is why this pharmacon, this magical potion, has been introduced. So again, we have marriage as a, as, as a, as a potion. Um, text N um, has to do with uh, John's argument, and I'm happy to come back to this if you want to talk about it. It's an important one, that uh, contrary to Roman civil law, which was the civil law under the um, Constantine and uh, post-Theodosian uh, emperors, um, that it is not adultery to have sex with prostitutes. Pornea is not adultery. Chrysostom is seeking to argue that it is um, in the eyes of God. Uh, and he draws upon Paul and Paul's law in 1 Corinthians 7 um, as an argument. Um, he also draws upon um, the majority text reading for you who are text critics here, um, in which uh, the goodwill that the husband has for the, for the, for the wife, the unoya, is the rationale for why he should, you know, that he is her possession. Um, she, uh, d he does not own his own body. She does, um, but that this should be geared out of the goodwill that he has for her. And we could uh, talk further about that. Now I want uh, to, to, to show you the concluding movements of the homily. On page 10, the third argument that John makes in the homily is uh, that Christian love magic is stronger than the prostitutes. So the rest of the homily is about learn it, practice it, use it. Um, now we've already seen him saying you should inscribe the, the, the amuletic force of 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4 on your house and, on, um, uh, and, 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 and elsewhere. Um, but I want you to see um, how this works. In text O, John's instructing them, right? So if you have a pharmacon, you need to know how to use it, right? Now, the pharmacon is marriage, but the pharmacon is also Paul's words about marriage. So hence, when you see a prostitute luring you in, setting a trap, lusting after your body, say to her, it's not my body, but it belongs to my wife. I don't dare to abuse it or give it into the hands of another woman. And let a wife do this too. So John is instructing that this be used as a performative utterance, right? As a kind of spell or counter spell. Um, then comes a very interesting argument about equality, because as you may know, in 1 Corinthians 7, 
Um, as patriarchal as also Paul's culture was, in that particular instance, Paul recites the formula both from the point of view of the man and from the point of view of the woman. And Chrysostom notices this and wants to argue that there is, in fact, um, uh, a great equality of privilege, as he puts it. Um, now I'm going to turn to, uh, to text 11. I'm going to start in about line 8 down. Consequently, regard the rest of women, he's obviously, talk, obviously talking to husbands, as though they were objects of stone, knowing that after marriage, if you look with eyes full of promiscuous intent at another woman, whether a common prostitute, this is a demosia, uh, is the, the Greek, or a married woman, you have become liable to accusations of acts of adultery. Now another usage. Sing these words as an incantation to yourself every day. Epadem is the Greek verb, and it means to sing as an incantation. It's not just sing a song, uh, right? And if you perceive that desire for another woman is being aroused in you, then here's how to make her seem repugnant to you. Go into your bedroom, unroll this book, and labon paulon mesitain, making Paul your go-between, continually sing these words as an incantation and thereby extinguish the flame. Now, this is an extraordinary uh, statement by John. Um, We've had a lot of fun in, when I've lectured on this, including at my home institution at the University of Chicago, thinking about what it means to make Paul your go-between here. Um, I want to present you with three options. Um, the first is, and this was my first inclination when I first translated this text, was that Paul, that was I translated it, it literally, Labon Paulon Masitain is, Taking Paul in as a middleman is what it literally means. And I first translated it as position Paul between her and you. And what I thought it meant was that Paul as the mesites, as the, it, it, that Paul is blocking. So literally the book, the text of First Corinthians is between you and the woman. It's your sword, if you will. Um, but it is true that the word mesites is found in novels um, and in treatises like Pseudo Lucian's Amatores that the Mesites is actually um, the Yenta. Um, the, the Mesites is usually the, the one who brings the parties together. It's the, um, the matchmaker, that's the word. It, it's the matchmaker. So another option is taking Paul as your matchmaker would then mean that he's saying your matchmaker with your own wife. In other words, that the text of 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4 um, is Paul bringing you and your proper wife back together again. So this is Paul as the matchmaker, which is a, a kind of neat, uh, neat idea. But there's a third option too. I wonder what you think about this. Is that Paul is your mesites, not between you and the prostitute, not between you in a positive way and your wife, but it's, he's your intermediary with God. That what's in view here uh, is, notice you're supposed to go into your chamber, that is it an echo of Matthew 6.6 6, um, and 1 Timothy 2.5 um, uh, kind of combined that in prayer you go into your closet and that therefore this act of reciting as an, uh, as an incantation, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4, is calling upon God in prayer, and Paul is the intermediary who helps script that prayer. Um, and in line with that is some, I mean, you know, Chrysostom was a monk, um, and probably never stopped being a monk, although he lived in uh, some of the biggest urban centers of the empire at the time. Um, but uh, the monks of Egypt, like in the Apothegmata Patrum, they speak about go sit in your cell and your cell will teach you everything. 
So, I mean, is the idea here that you're supposed to go and pray and that Paul is your mesites between you and God rather than, you know, either uh, uh, blocking you from the, from the porne or bringing you into better uh, relation with your wife. Um, in favor of option two is the way the passage continues into Q. Because he goes on to say, and in this way also, your wife will again be more desirable to you. So here you see the positive effects of the Christian love magic, if you will, that it not only av uh, averts the porne, but that it inspires the proper uh, love and ardor between the marital um, couple. Um, so in the passages that, that come next, there's even more evidence of how Chrysostom is playing upon um, magical terminology in some very specific ways, especially in passage T. Um, for those of you interested in, in ancient magic, there's a cluster of about eight technical terms for magic all in there. And it's quite clear that John knows what he's talking about and he's worried about this uh, black magic of the porne. Um, and in text U, you can see that the problem with, with uh, um, succumbing to her spells is that you lose God as your ally, Sumachos. And as such, then, you have lost the power that um, adherence to the Christian gospel and adherence to Paul's words should give you in the face of the demons of Pornea. Um, last passage uh, for presentation is the last one, text Y. This is the very conclusion to the homily, and it's quite extraordinary, uh, I think. John said, and, and I'm, you need to remember, you are in the church in Constantinople, and the man before you is uh, a bishop, and he is a celibate man. Thus let us continually sing these words as an incantation, both to ourselves and to our wives. And hence, I too shall conclude now using these words, but on account of sexual misconduct, da -da 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 -da, but a wife has it. By keeping these words with careful attention in the marketplace and at home, day and night, at table and in bed, everywhere, let's practice them ourselves and let's instruct our wives both to say them to us and to hear them from us so that after living the present life with due chasteness, we might attain the kingdom of heaven. And then comes Chrysostom's customary uh, doxology, which ends the homily. So I think you can see here that Chrysostom actually leads his congregation in a public incantation of the Christian marriage pharmacon, of the Christian marriage spell, um, which is to protect against the demons of sexual malfeasance and in particular of, of, of prostitutes. This is how um, one of the greatest orator bishops, uh, public Christian intellectuals and spokespersons in the last quarter of the fourth century tried to turn the Titanic around, tried to change the customary, cu the, the customary modes of marriage celebrations and marriage and to instill um, a new Christian culture. But at the same time, he doesn't just repudiate the old, but he annexes its power and a good deal of its logic in terms of both um, magic that averts evil and a magic that calls the good God, in this case, uh, to your side as your ally. Thanks for your patience. I look forward to your further comments.
sex with members of one's own household, in particular one's slave, who were, uh, you know, uh, even same sex, but uh, who were considered to be sexually available to their master, according to the, the logic of things, just as in a way the, 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 the public prostitutes that work in the CIA, they are in public, kind of anybody can have them. Um, that's, uh, there is not a theatrical law. talking about the sin of going to the physical prostitutes, and he's trying to convince them, like, when he obviously sees this as a habit, and he wants them to break this habit, but he's acting like they're going to take a while, and they're going to keep doing it. And he's saying, you know, it's okay, just, you know, let's go at this a little bit at a time, you know, you can overcome it. But, you know, in other parts of the empire, at least, adultery is regarded as one of the three capital sins. I mean, there's only one penance for this, so I was just wondering, it makes it maybe, are you familiar with that? I, you know, I hadn't thought of this connection. I will, I will check it, and I thank you for that, for that reference. I think, you know, mostly the, the, the legal rules about adultery are, again, because when it comes back to your point about the patriarchy, right? You said um, um, adultery is a crime because it's a kind of property crime against the man who owns Right? So for you to, to have another man's wife is to abuse his property for you. And that's why like, literally the prostitute being the Mosia is just public. She doesn't belong to anybody. Right? So there's no one who there, there's no one who can use a claim. That's the logic of the law, as I understand it. But I look up the NCIA and I appreciate that. But, um, that doesn't sound at all on my um, except to the degree that he's not going to hold out forever. I mean, that, 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 that he would say, okay, you know, keep trying or, or whatever. But he, he would back out that at the point that. Um, he likes to talk about the idea about ethical worker or ethical sort of not, um, not sharpness. And at a certain point, for someone who invents it, who continually to give excuses, I can just, I can almost write it myself. I've done it. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to ask. Well, just a minor point. You consistently translate what they ask yeah. as sexual misconduct yeah. rather than a plural form. Of it. Uh, do you do that in order to indicate that it could be sort of things, practice and cases of, uh, yeah. I mean, that's language in 72. I mean, I don't know if we, I don't have a plural in English other than cases of. And that gets clumsy yeah. um, over and over. And John certainly uses the singular and the plural when executing all these yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. Um, do you have an alternative? No, it's just, I think in 7-2, I think Barry suggests that it's because there have been cases of sexual yeah. misconduct. It's been a repeated action rather than a single case. That's the way you uh, yeah. capture the pool. And of course, there's a textual variant of something that yeah. uh, because the, the singular makes more sense in certain spots. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, right before it, in 618, Paul says, who did the case for now? Yeah. In the singular. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree on that on the exegetical point, but I think that the principle that Cornea is a generalized state, I don't think John could be sort of off with My main concern, I think, for many, for all of us in a way, is that, that uh, the problem of, of, of it being kind of a fornication, which I think um, yeah. uh, is an imprecise yeah. um, image of Cornea. Yeah. So I, I like to use sexual malfeasance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, for sexual misconduct. Yeah, I think sexual misconduct is better than sexual impropriety because mm -hmm. it is an yeah. action that is misconduct. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 I would just have a suggestion of how to pluralize it. Uh -huh. Just translate misdeeds. 
with uh, moral psychology that says that the problem of enmity itself is that people, when they hate another and they fall with one, can't bear to hear their name, can't even bear to think about them without becoming a And then John says, so Paul knows, and for him, Paul knew all things, and Paul was the great philosopher, knowing this. I want to be sure this one gets on tape, it's kind of cool, um, is that human life in this world is mud wrestling with the devil. Um, he, that's always there in his mind. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that he always provides a demonological frontline diagnosis. Because a lot of times he can say, the problem is you, right? You know, that, that you know, all you have, you know, Paul didn't have anything that you don't have. Paul had the same body as you and the same soul as you, and Paul was able to practice these virtues. You should be able to practice these virtues. Um, but always around the edges, I mean, or as a backdrop, is this sense that the human is beset by demonic powers. And so he's seeking to coordinate, um, in a sense, several different paradigms for, um, uh, for sin. And you know, in this particular case, um, the, the demonological is very strong um, because he views these actions as actually, um, you know, like, as he says, these are demonic processions. These are demonic hymns. They are um, because they're calling upon the gods uh, and the gods uh, of the uh, majority cultural religion um, are considered to be demons um, in, in Christian culture from the second century probably by Paul, like by Paul in the Tropics of Passage of the of Sacred City 10, and certainly uh, second through fourth century. So you're quite right, it's there, but it's not an, a complete alternative to um, uh, a moral anthropology. Um, and Chrysostom, as you may know, in, in relation to your good question, that um, Chrysostom has a pretty um, uh, optimistic um, uh, moral psychology, that is that he, he, he emphasizes repeatedly um, that people ought to be able to practice the virtues. Um, he was deemed a semi-Palladian um, in his own time and afterwards. And, and in the West, those who translated him into Latin were themselves, like Anianus of Sameda and others, were themselves Pelagians or, sem or, or, or semi-Palladians. Um, uh, but at the same time, of course, Augustine himself, throughout his, his lifetime, um, uh, it was in his later period, in his contestation with Pelagius and, 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 and uh, Pelagius' followers, that Augustine's especially strong um, uh, emphasis on the 
the, the corrupted human will uh, came to the fore. Um, and they were in conversation, not directly, but uh, Augustine knows of Christopher's writings in the first and then in three places. So this is a live conversation on which I think Augustine and Chrysostom would agree often, but not always on like what's at the top of the dial, right? Because I mean, Augustine has a perfectly robust demonology um, as well. Um, but at certain points, um, depending on the purpose, depending upon the, the, the theological point they want to make, they can stress the human will more than the demonic force or the other. Thank you.